please welcome Andrew Ross Sorkin and his guest, Chair of the Federal Trade Commission, Lena Khan. Lena Khan is here, everybody. Uh, you were just meeting Bob Iger for the first time. You don't like to meet. Do you like to meet CEOs, by the way? We're always happy to meet CEOs as part of our process. And so, uh, you know, oftentimes if we've done an investigation, gotten a recommendation to move forward, uh, as part of that, we usually sit down both with the lawyers, but also often they bring the execs. And so we meet as part of that process. Um, let me properly introduce Alina Khan. Uh, she is, of course, um, possibly one of the most consequential figures in the world of business right now. Uh, she runs the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, she is the youngest chair in the history of the FTC. Uh, in September, she made her biggest and boldest move yet, along with 17 states filing an antitrust uh, lawsuit against Amazon, accusing the company of illegally using its market power to raise prices and exclude competition. We're going to talk about that. She famously wrote a paper about Amazon uh, while uh, at Yale Law School, and it was titled Amazon's Antitrust Paradox. In her more than two years at the helm of the agency, she's now investigated and challenged nearly 40 uh, mergers. There are a lot of CEOs who are scared of Lena Khan. Um, nice to see you. Great to be here. here. Um, you've been involved in a, a whole number of cases, um, some of which never went to court, some that went to court uh, where you, you didn't win. I'm curious what your idea, and I think a lot of the business community is trying to figure out what your idea of winning is. What does it mean to win for you in your role? So look, the Federal Trade Commission has an incredibly important job, right? We're the main cop on the beat uh, for unfair methods of competition or unfair deceptive acts or practices across a huge chunk of the economy. Uh, so we have a big job. We have limited resources. And so we have to think about how can we have the greatest impact on what we identify as some of the biggest problems. And so we are focused very much on areas like healthcare, on food and agriculture, uh, really have spent a lot of time talking to market participants, businesses, big and small, to understand where are their choke points and what can we be doing. The other th big thing for us is to have impact we're focused not just on bringing individual lawsuits, but also on bringing um, on in issue, issuing rules. So these are market-wide right. rules that we've issued on areas like non-competes, junk fees. I think big picture success for us looks like making sure the public knows that the FTC is in their corner fighting right. for them against illegal business. How practices. much of your business then is about deterrence, meaning that nobody even does the deal because they're too scared to bring it to you? I mean, look, as a law enforcer with limited resources, you want to promote deterrence, right? And there are a few components of that. One is you need to be clear about what the rules are, right? So bright line rules that are making clear what is permitted, what's not permitted. And so that's why we at the FTC actually prefer those types of per se prohibitions rather than complex regulations that oftentimes favor big incumbents over small businesses and startups. The other factor for us is how do we make sure we're addressing root problems and the kind of root culprits? And so, you know, as an enforcer, sometimes there can be a temptation to jack up or juice up your enforcement numbers by going after low-level players, right? So go after all these mobsters rather than focus your energy on the boss at the top. And we're really focused on actually looking upstream. And so, for example, we recently brought a lawsuit for a private equity roll-up and as the anesthesiology yep. market. There's a lot of Texas. people in private equity that are not worried about you. They weren't before. <laughs> and as part of that, we named not just U.S. anesthesiology partners, but also the private equity firm, Walsh Carson, that we believe had orchestrated the whole scheme. And so you want clear rules. You want to be, you know, holding not just the low-level people accountable, but also the folks at the right. top. That also includes individual CEOs, which we've done as well. But what do you feel? I'm just curious as a human. Uh, you've brought these cases, and there's a number of them that you've lost, big ones. I'm talking about Microsoft Activision. Uh, I'm talking about the meta, uh, uh, the, the meta deal. Do you, on a day like that, do you say to myself, do you say to yourself, we shouldn't have done that? We should have done that? We missed something? What, what do you think? Look, whenever we bring a case, we want to win it. And we only bring it because we believe the facts and the law are on our side and that we should win it. Of course, when we have setbacks, we're disappointed. Uh, we look at those cases closely. We try to figure out what went wrong, what could we have done better. Uh, if we believe that the court made, you know, errors, uh, then we have the opportunity to appeal. 
The big picture, um, you know, we are quite pleased with our efforts, right? So we have filed overall uh, 11 lawsuits against mergers. Uh, in five instances, the companies abandoned outright. Uh, and a whole set of other instances, the company settled. Uh, and we had two losses, uh, one of which is currently on appeal. Separate from that, there were 14 deals that were abandoned just after we started investigating and before we had the chance to actually file a lawsuit. So big picture, of course, the two cases that we lost, we would have wanted to win, but we're quite pleased overall with our But efforts. fair to say that you have a much more aggressive approach to antitrust than has been a historic case, uh, historically the case. I mean, you, you are approaching this in a way that most people that were in your uh, seat before did not. And people are looking at this and they're saying to themselves, you know, what does it mean? To, what does it mean for business? What does it mean for deal making? Is she right? Are the courts all going to ultimately decide that actually she's not right? By the way, if they do that, do, would you change your? If, if, if you started losing more cases, do you say I'm not going to bring the next case? Do you do you sit and play the odds before you bring the case? A, a lot of lawyers in the room probably, you know, get asked, you know, what do you think that you know, before bringing a case, any kind of case, they say, what's the chance we're going to win? Is there a number that you say to yourself, it's got to be 70 percent, otherwise we're not going to do it? Well, look, it's, it's very fact-specific. It's very case-specific. Uh, it's also dependent on resources. I mean, we're a fairly small agency, all things considered, around 1,200 people. And so we max out the capacity. And so we have to pick our battles pretty carefully. Uh, with M&A, of course, it's also a fluid environment. And so you right. don't know when you're deciding today what lawsuits to bring, what proposed deals may come down the pipe in two weeks, in a month, in two months. And so uh, the decision making there can be quite dynamic. Just to zoom out in terms of the current antitrust environment, this is not happening in a vacuum. Right. In June 2021, President Biden signed an executive order where he said, unfortunately, for the last few decades, competition has been declining across the American economy be it in our airline sector, be it in our telecom sector, uh, really excessive consolidation and concentration now looks to be a systemic feature of our economy rather than isolated. And after saying that, he charged both the FTC, the DOJ, but really agencies across the board with reinvigorating our competition tools and making sure that consumers, workers, businesses, uh, innovation, our democracy are all better positioned once we have more competition. How much do you think that you have to be a crystal ball um, sort of uh, looking down what's going to happen? And how much do you worry that you'll be wrong? So it's a really good question. And there's no doubt that the merger enforcement part of our work is intrinsically predictive, right? The law anticipates that. And they say that the responsibility and obligation on the FTC is not to predict with total certainty what's going to happen. We deal in probabilities, not certainties. And so what we're engaged in is a risk assessment. If this deal goes through, uh, what's the likelihood that it may substantially lessen competition or tend to create a monopoly? And so we look at the evidence, right? We look at the documents. Uh, are the company's documents showing that right now they're actually competing head to head with this firm, be it on lower end right. prices or fighting for the same talent pool or investing in R&D? Uh, we talk to other market participants, uh, be it their customers, their rivals. Um, and we also think about not just competition today, but competition in the future. Where is this market going? And we've seen in areas like platforms, the direct threat is not coming from an exact replica. But, you know, Microsoft was threatened by Netscape and the middleware companies. And so you need to also have a sense of where is the market going? One of the reasons I wanted to ask you this, and I'm going to bring something up that you're probably not going to love. I don't even know if you're going to remember this. Um, this goes to the crystal ball issue, though. And it really is an interesting thing because regulators do have to decide what they think is about to happen, right? So uh, several years ago, and we just had David Zaslav here, Time Warner, or I should say AT&T was going to uh, merge Time Warner and AT&T together. Um, in fact, Megan Delrahim up, up there uh, was at the DOJ at the time. And uh, when the, the judge lost, or when, when, the, when, 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 they, when he lost the case effectively um, and, and the deal was allowed to go through, you said the following. You said the DOJ should appeal the decision and ask the D.C. Circuit to overturn Judge Leon's misguided opinion. This is when you were at open markets. 
You said, with Time Warner's must-have content, including March Madness at HBO, AT&T will be able to hobble rival content distributors and dictate the terms on which competitors can participate in the market. Furthermore, the merger creates an effective duopoly in distribution between AT&T and Comcast. AT&T will be able to use Time Warner's programming as a weapon to defend its business model, stifle existing competition uh, and existing uh, threats, and steer the trajectory of the industry. I, I bring you this because I think we all now know uh, AT&T is a complete mess. Um, AT it's, it's, uh, T-Mobile is now the largest uh, uh, telephone provider in the country. Um, David Zaslav's uh, job is as challenging as ever now. That is a challenged business. The entire thing was a challenged business. Now, maybe you sh weren't supposed to know that at the time. I don't know. But I, I bring this to you because I'm curious how you think about that just as a, a sort of thought experiment. Yeah, it's a good question. And of course, you know, when you're an academic or an outsider researcher, you don't have access to the same information as an enforcer. Big picture, there is a fundamental question in antitrust enforcement, which is when faced with uncertainty, how do you balance the error costs, right? Is it better, if, you're, if you might get it wrong, is it better to get it wrong in the direction of acting or is it better to get it wrong in the direction of not having acted? And for you know, several decades, there had been the view uh, that it was better to err on the side of being hands off. Right. The view being that even if you were to have monopoly power, that monopoly power would be dissipated by entry, by market forces, and whereas it would be difficult to undo or fix the harms of an erroneous government decision. I think we're at a stage where we realize that that inaction, that bias in favor of inaction, has had enormous costs right across our economy. And so that's why you're seeing this rebalance that's going on right now um, to make sure that we're not you know, following that course and erring on the side of not acting. What about, um, I want to talk about Amazon, because that was actually about what your paper was originally about. And now you, have, you brought the case, effectively. And it's one of the first cases where you have a company that ostensibly has provided lower prices. I say ostensibly because you don't believe that they have, ultimately. But that the prime membership program and everything else um, is effectively a monopoly power. Now, they look at this and say, look, we're, we're a retailer. And in the context of retail, they would say we're 4% of retail or 7% of retail. And retail is this, this big thing. You are defining it in the context of your case simply among this idea of sort of super retailers, right? And there's probably only one or two or three in that category at all, maybe one, actually. And so I'm curious how you think about, part of it is about market size and constructing that size and then the market power that you have in that size. Yeah, I mean, this is one of the core parts of antitrust analysis is how you're defining the relevant market. Uh, millions of dollars get spent on this particular part of the fight. And oftentimes antitrust cases, you know, fall and rise based on whether you win on market definition. Um, in the complaint, we lay out why we believe that the online superstore market is the right way to look at this. Uh, we point to, you know, factors like depth and quality, um, range of selection that we believe set you know, online superstars, uh, superstores apart from, from the other stores. Uh, we also rely on not just what's known as indirect evidence, where you're, you know, drawing the market and calculating the shares, but also what's known as direct evidence of monopoly power. And so this is when you're looking at the company's behavior, right? If you have a monopoly, one sign of that can be, if you, sorry, I should be clear. If you have a monopoly that's managed to insulate itself from competition, one sign of that can be that the monopoly is able to harm its customers with impunity. And we lay out in the complaint a whole set of evidence that suggests Amazon has been able to do that, just that. It's been able to do that, we allege, uh, with the set of customers on the seller side. So it now, it has steadily raised the fees that it charges these sellers. It now on average takes close to 50% of the cut. So one out of every $2. It's also steadily been degrading the shopping experience by flooding its search page with ads. Um, sometimes they're relevant, but as our complaint found, they actually also have been jacking up what, what are basically junk ads, irrelevant ads. And so we lay out uh, in the complaint a portrait of, we believe, a company that has, you know, through anti-competitive practices, shielded itself off from competition and is now exploiting that power well, what, through what hurting its customers. People's own ability, and you'd think on the internet, 
you'd be able to click off and find whatever you want. I mean, do you subscribe to Prime, by the way? I don't. You don't subscribe to Prime? I do not. Interesting. Why? Uh, I just haven't. I mean, look, this is not an area where I believe people through their consumer experiences need to stand up, but um, just personally, I haven't. No, the reason I ask, so I'm a Prime subscriber. I happen to be a Prime subscriber. Um, I, I, by the way, the experience thus far seems good to me, but uh, who, who am I to say? But I also think that if I wanted to see other prices or wanted to go to another site, I could do that remarkably easily. I mean, I don't even have to walk outside to do it. And so it's a very interesting thing to think that they have this, quote unquote, monopoly power over all of these consumers who have chosen, hopefully through their own free will, to become prime subscribers. No? Yeah, I mean, look, this was, um, you know, an argument that we've heard in other contexts as well. You know, Google famously has argued that competition is just a click away. And certainly, you know, I think especially in the early 2000s, there was a view that there are very few switching costs, that, you know, all you have to do is type a different uh, website address, um, and that that means that you're not really going to see monopoly power in the digital age. I think two decades on, we've seen that that is flatly untrue, right? There are all sorts of ways in which the power of defaults, in which consumer behavior, uh, in which, you know, behavioral economics has shown that actually this stuff can be quite sticky. And once you're in a particular ecosystem, there are all sorts of ways that companies can keep you in that ecosystem in ways that make it especially important that you're, you know, promoting competition and preventing lock-in. Um. We had a number of merger, or we had a number of media company CEOs who just met Bob Iger, and there's a big question about whether there should be deals allowed. I just mentioned a deal in the past that was allowed, and uh, here we are now. There's been a lot of those companies that are waiting, thinking, "What's going to happen with this election? What's going? Are you still going to be in this role next year?" What do you think of the, the the media landscape right now, and what do you think also of CEOs who are saying, "Maybe I should wait. Maybe I shouldn't wait. Maybe I should." try to wait you out, or maybe you're going to take me to court now, but, you know, in a couple of years from now, you're not going to be in this role anyway. So, look, our job is to enforce the laws that Congress has charged us with. Um, and so, you know, we look at the deals co- that come in through the door. Uh, we have been, you know, doing a reassessment. So we issued this past summer draft merger guidelines that we believe provide the market with a clear sense of what are the tools and analytical frameworks that we at the antitrust agencies are going to be using when these deals right. come in. And so, you know, that really lays out our approach, and we're going to continue kind of faithfully following it. There's a big question about whether the laws as they are written today make sense. I imagine you might think that there should be more, that the laws should be changed. In Europe, they actually did change the laws. They, they, have, they have changed the laws. Do you think the laws in the U.S. need to be changed? Look, that's ultimately a decision for Congress to make. Um, you know, they have done various investigations and inquiries and identified where those can be updated. Uh, for us at the FTC, we certainly see that, you know, for example, um, currently the, the Hart Scott Rodino Act only gives the agencies 30 days to make an assessment about whether a deal requires a closer look. That law goes back to the 1970s. If you look at the legislative history, lawmakers assumed that the agencies would only get 150 merger filings a year. We're obviously in a very different environment. We get up to, you know, 3,000 filings. Deals have become much more complex. And so, you know, being tethered to that 30-day period, for example, can be quite limiting. Um, It's also clear that, you know, the courts are currently engaged in an assessment of how these age-old principles, right, the Sherman Antitrust Act 1890, the FTC Act 1914, uh, Clayton Act 1914, how these old laws apply in very new contexts, including digital markets. And so I think there is an open question right now, and we have a whole set of cases that are working their way through the courts, about, you know, how the courts will apply these principles in these new markets. And I know Congress is watching very closely as well. We're going to run out of time. I want to uh, open up to questions. Maybe, I don't know if Macon Delrahim might even have one. But before we do that, I have, I do have one more for you, which is one of the other things you've gone after is non-competes. It's a big issue uh, in the world of business. Um, What do you think of what's happened here? Um, And do you, do you believe that there should be effectively a federal ban on non-competes? So that's what we proposed uh, effectively Uh, in January. We proposed a rule that would eliminate the vast majority of non-competes. Are there times when a non-compete is valuable? Is there a time when you'd say to yourself, you know what, I'm going to pay as a a business leader for the privilege. I'm going to pay that employee more for that. I'm not talking, and I agree with you, by the way, you look at the hairdressers and some of the other sort of uh, 
uh, workers that are under non-competes that may be unfair, but is there a moment or a period of time where you'd say, in this context, I'm okay with a non-compete? Maybe, and those are some of the questions that we asked. Um, we got 20,000 comments. Um, a whole set of those comments were actually not just from the low wage, you know, security guard workers or fast food workers, uh, but from doctors, from engineers, uh, from technologists, uh, from journalists. And they shared stories about, A, how oftentimes they're actually not in a position to really bargain with their future employer when they're signing right. that contract, but also that there can be all sorts of other ramifications, right? And so we're looking at the impact, not just on workers, uh, where we assess, you know, that worker wages are, are down to the tune of up to $300 billion because of these non-competes, but also the effect on competition as a whole, right? Because if you have a worker who's effectively locked into a job, that's bad, not just that for that worker, but also for other workers who won't have the opportunity if that job were ever to open up. And we've also found that sometimes it's, you know, with um, higher skilled workers or workers with greater expertise that you might have the greatest prospect for those individuals to go and start their own businesses. And so from a competition perspective, I mean, these things are called non-competes. Um, and so we think, you know, they deserve an enormous amount of scrutiny and that the economy on the whole would probably be healthier without them. We're over time, but uh, let me get a microphone to Macon because I know he did have a question. Megan Del Rahim, who I should say used to run the antitrust uh, division at the Department of Justice, actually sat on the stage several years ago, uh, I think actually talking about that deal, by the way. Maybe you can comment on, uh, you guys were actually in sync on that, uh, oddly enough. We were in sync. And I think uh, that particular, you know, I think when David bought Time Warner, it was without DirecTV, which really caused a competitive concern. So I supported Lena's comments with, uh, with respect to the appeal. We appealed and lost again. Um, Lena, congratulations on your accomplishments and your tenure at the FTC. I'm going to ask you a question about more government institutional design. And, you know, in practice, I get asked by boards about a particular merger and how do you predict this? And a lot of times it depends which agency gets to see it. They have different legal standards, different procedures, which is difficult to make a decision um, because a bunch of mergers, you don't know where it goes. And there's been, so you have the FTC and DOJ do an antitrust. There's been a lot of enforcement actions that you probably would have supported, but unfortunately for you, the commission was deadlocked 2-2. Or historically, Microsoft, later Google, both 2-2 votes, and the enforcement action wasn't brought until the Justice Department had to come in. Do you think we need two antitrust agencies at the federal level anymore? Do we need competition, enforcement of competition? Or is it time to redesign the government and merge those two agencies? It's an interesting question, and, you know, the FTC is not just a competition agency, but also a consumer protection agency. But on the competition front, I mean, obviously there are areas where the antitrust division and the FTC overlap. But there are also really important ways in which they differ. So the antitrust division has criminal enforcement authority, which we at the FTC don't. Um, the FTC's authorities are actually broader than what the DOJ enforces. So we have something called our Unfair Methods of Competition Authority, which extends beyond the four corners of the Sherman Act or the Clayton Act. Uh, we also have more policy tools. So we can promulgate rules, we can do market studies. And so I actually see, for the most part, a lot of complementarity between the two agencies. Uh, it's certainly too, true that in some prior eras, there was a lot of friction between the agencies, turf wars. Uh, I have a great relationship with our current AAG, Jonathan Cantor, and our agencies have a great partnership, and we think that we are you know, both stronger as a result of that. Lena Khan, everybody, thank you. Thank you very, very much.